So welcome um, to the technical track, first breakout session, and I'm very happy to announce Kieran Gold and Daniel Pötzinger, CEO and CTO of AOE Media, who created the Angry Bird shop on Magento. And ever since I've been working with them, since about two years ago, I started to know them, I was very impressed with their level of professionalism and inspired by the solutions they create. So I'm very happy they're here and thanks for coming. Thank you, Vina. Yep. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Um, so today we're going to talk about the Angry Birds cloud deployment um, with, with two subtopics. One of them is, is auto scaling. Um, we believe that the Angry Birds store is one of the um, you know, highest scale Magento stores out there at the moment. Um, and uh, secondly, we will talk about continuous integration and deployment in the cloud. So maybe just a little bit of information about um, the, the actual project. So Angry Birds was in the situation that they uh, needed to do something about their merchandising store. They had started with a, a very simple um, SaaS solution and they needed to really roll out their e-commerce e operations globally. And uh, one of the, the main reasons for that was that nowadays um, actually Angry Birds only makes about 40% of their revenue with the game and licenses for the game itself. And all of the rest is done through merchandising and licensing of their products. So um, e-commerce has become a, a very, very important uh, revenue stream for them. And they were looking for a solution that um, can scale with their extreme peaks that they have. They are a, a very unusual company in terms of the peaks they have. Um, most e-commerce stores have the typical two peaks a year. And um, uh, Angry Birds has peaks whenever they launch a new game. And those peaks uh, can be you know, up to uh, like 80 times the normal traffic. So, yeah, let's go into um, the general architecture that uh, we set up for this environment. Okay, so this is just the first high-level um, view of the Magento universe that is used for Angry Birds. Of course, we have the Magento Enterprise version in kind of center that does uh, yeah, all the shop functionality. We have several storefronts for all the different regions. Um, it's also used for financial reporting in the back end. Um, all the products are really managed in Magento. A uh, special thing here is that um, the, the inventories are also managed um, for different warehouses. Um, and of course, all the order management is done there. Magento is connected to some third party um, services in this uh, project. So we have a DRM server that is responsible for um, yeah, fetching the licenses whenever you buy a PC game, for example part of the auto management workflow. We have a separate mail service that's especially important if you uh, deploy to the cloud because you need a way to reliably send emails. Um, we are doing this uh, through a separate mail service. We have a gift card service for off, uh, um, marketing uh, and we use Braintree as a payment provider. Uh, a special thing here is that uh, the Magento store is connected to Shipwire which uh, is responsible for the fulfillment in the inventory management. This is also where um, Magento gets all the inventory stocks for the different warehouses from. Shipwire is a pretty unique service in that sense that um, they, they are actually able to manage several warehouses all over the globe and unify the, the entire inventory management through one interface. So basically, for example, if you're ordering something from Argentina, it might actually be cheaper to ship it from the UK rather than shipping it from the US. So Shipwire does all this automation fully automatically and we have a full, fully integrated interface with Shipwire that makes that possible to, to cons constantly optimize the shipping costs and the, and the shipping times as well. So why did we decide to, to do this with the Amazon Cloud? Uh, primarily, it, initially it was uh, uh, Rovio's input that, that you know, showed that they needed to have something that could really scale for the immense peaks that they uh, face sometimes. And of course, in general, the idea, as you know, of the cloud is that you can scale quickly on demand and pay only when you need it. And if you only need the, the really high loads uh, on you know, three, four days a year, then of course having a, a monster farm yourself of service does not make much sense. Okay, this is the main advantage of course, that uh, you can scale up quickly and scale down quickly and only pay for the hours the, the servers are really running. Uh, there's another great benefit of uh, considering Amazon Cloud um, for, for hosting. Um, this is that you have a couple of useful services 
that are really professional and that you can use. I'll list them now, what we use for, for the Angry Build store. So of course we have the EC2 service, that's the most basic service from Amazon Cloud, where you actually uh, can request new virtual machines and deploy whatever you want to have there. We have S3 as a storage backend. This is where you can store files reliable. Um, we have the Amazon RDS service, relational database service, that actually offers the MySQL back database for, for, for Magento. We have CloudFront, that is the Amazon's uh, content delivery network that delivers the images and the assets and the CSS files. Um, the good thing about this CloudFront is they have cloud edges or edge servers around the world and from wherever you call the website, you get all the stuff from the nearest edge location. So that's really fast to deliver assets. We use Elastic Cache as a memcache compatible cache backend. Uh, we use ELB, that's the Elastic Load Balancer service from Amazon. And we use something that's not so well known uh, or not so well used. That's root 53, that's kind of DNS servers from Amazon where you can say, okay, now please, um, this domain should point to this IP. And it's immediately um, live. As you might know, uh, on top of the service, or you can use all the services through the Amazon Web Services or through the Amazon console. Um, we have another service on top of that called RightScale uh, that we use. Um, RightScale itself uses the Amazon Web Services and offers some additional useful um, concepts for doing deployments. We'll see that later. But of course, also running stuff in the cloud, it, it also has some, some clear drawbacks and things that you need to consider. Um, as you just saw in the slide before, there's quite some complexity to running stuff in the cloud. You don't just have a load balancer and, and two web nodes and a MySQL server. You actually have to handle like you know seven different services. You have to handle the scaling. You have to, to handle all the, all the deployment, etc. So that definitely adds complexity to, to it. And you also need to plan for failover of EC2. Um, that is something that, that, of course, you need to consider as, as with any failover. Um, but especially here, it's part of EC2 that uh, instance can go down immediately or break. Um, that's the nature. You can bring up new ones instantly. So you need to plan for this. Security is, a, is an important aspect to plan as well in the cloud, obviously. And um, you need to adjust the application in most cases. So we needed to adjust uh, quite a bit of uh, functionality in Magento to fully support this. And one thing that is specific with the Amazon cloud, they are a kind of use as is service so that you cannot expect a huge amount of service and support from them. So you need to figure this out yourself if you want to work with that. Okay, let's summarize some of the main uh, requirements that we of course have for this project. Um, it should be a high, high available system. So uh, in this case, where you need to plan for failover, that means we need to plan for multiple failovers that different services or different machines can go down. Um, we wanted the, the whole setup uh, in a way that working in the Magento backend don't influence uh, the front end rendering or the order process, as well as uh, that all the scheduler tasks that need to be done with talking with the third party um, services and also all the Magento schedule tasks, the same, they shouldn't influence front end performance. Um, because of all the traffic peaks, um, yeah, it was, yeah, we need um, really intensive uh, caching, so we need to cache a lot and cache intelligent, and we need to think of asset management in the cloud. Um, you'll see this. Okay, let's uh, get a bit more technical with an overview of how actually the hosting or the cloud infrastructure of this uh, system looks like. We'll start with the most basic setup, so with this is just a basic um, yeah, load balanced or clustered uh, setup for, for Magento Store. So you have uh, a load balancer. In our case, we use Varnish because uh, Varnish is not just a load balancer, but it can also be used to cache a lot of stuff. Um, but in the most basic setup, setup, consider this to be a load balancer, load balancing between different front end nodes. Um, and they are all using one database that is uh, offered by the RDS service. Um, because we want the work in the back end and, work and the work from the scheduler task independently from the uh, shop performance, we have separate front, uh, separate server areas for the back end. So the load balancer load balance uh, the back end domain to a separate set of servers um, and the front end domain to a separate set. And all the scheduler tasks are also only activated on uh, another set of servers. As I mentioned, you need to think of 
how to handle assets. So when you upload images to, to products or uh, CMS blocks, uh, we store them in a common S3 bucket that is accessed by our front-end servers. And the images are directly delivered from the S3 bucket through CloudFront um, distribution. So all the images are handled this way. Because we have multiple uh, load balancer or multiple varnishes, we need an instance that actually load balances between the load balancers. We use the Elastic Load Balancing Service for this. Um, also, we have a second CloudFront distribution that delivers all the other skin files, so not um, all the files that belong to your templates and the CSS and JavaScript is delivered through a separate <coughs> CloudFront um, distribution that is connected to the, to the ELB. And in between this, we have this root 53 service. This is used for deployment, we'll see this later, to be able to instantly switch between different releases. In addition, we have the Elastic Cache uh, service as acting as a cache backend for, for Magento, accessed by the front-end servers. And we have a, a separate S3 bucket where we um, store all the stuff that is needed to bring up um, a new front-end server or a new back-end server. So basically, this S3 bucket has all the uh, Angry Birds, Magento, shop release packages, the install packages stored there. And uh, the auto-scaling rules uh, apply to all the arrays. So um, there's a set of rules for each of these uh, server arrays that, for example, say, um, yeah, if the CPU idle time is below this for the last two minutes, the server votes for crow, and if a several, several amount of server votes for crow, this array scales up. So this is fully automatically and adjusts to the, to the traffic piece. OK. <coughs> Um, let's step a bit back. I want, want to uh, talk about um, scaling in general and um, that it's all about finding the bottleneck. And scaling in our case means, of course, we want to deliver more product views and, of course, we want to process more orders. So that, is, that is our main goal of scaling. And I'll show um, yeah, how you find the bottleneck or how actually um, the bottleneck can move. So let's also begin with the most basic setup. We have a simple load balancer, load balancing between two <coughs> front-end servers. They access one database. This setup can handle a certain amount of traffic. The builds are the amount of traffic, kind of. Um, soon you will consider, okay, the front-end servers will become the bottleneck. You need more CPU to render the pages to process the orders. <coughs> so you can just add more front-end servers. And the bottleneck drops, but moves somewhere else. So this, this setup can handle more traffic, but since all front-end servers now access the same database, this will soon become your bottleneck. You have several um, possibilities there to move the bottleneck away from the database. For example, you can scale up the database, add more read slaves, um, but the cool thing to do is actually look um, how the database is used. So um, most of the cases, um, you render the home page, the category pages, all these pages, and they all read from the database. That's a huge read load to the database. So actually, we thought of, okay, these pages don't have much dynamic content per session. So actually, we thought of caching <coughs> them all. So we replaced the simple load balancing <coughs> by really a varnish, and we need to adjust Magento in a way that for all the pages that could be statically cached, uh, Magento sends the correct um, HTTP cache address. So we tell Varnish, okay, the home page can be cached for, I don't know, a day or something like this. Um, and then this page only needs to be rendered once, and then it's delivered by Varnish. For the dynamic stuff that you still have on the, on the page, there are two solutions. Either you can use Ajax to grab, for example, the basket for the session. What we do here, we store even the uh, basket information in the cookie. So um, there's no single request to any front-end server when you just browse around the, the Angry Bird store. So this setup can handle much more traffic. We even can drop some of the front-end servers. We don't need them anymore. <coughs> and we'll have a lot more um, requests handled by, by the setup. The bottleneck will then potentially move to just the bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth. Uh, you cannot deliver more pages and assets. So you can add more varnishes. You double the bandwidth. Um, you can add a CloudFront distribution that delivers all the image and CSS files. They don't need to be delivered by varnish. And this setup can handle huge traffic already, so that it's then time to, okay, um, only the orders hit the front ends, and then the front ends become, again, the, the bottleneck. 
you can scale the front end array, and the same things begin, begin like, like previously. So setup can handle more. We have the database as a bottleneck. Again, what we did here is introduce other cache backends, like using the memcache um, and not the database as cache backend to even reduce the load on the database, and so forth. Um, this kind of shows how, how to analyze and monitor your entire system and see where the bottleneck is, and then scale up and see where it is now to improve um, this, the, the requests. Okay, I said that uh, we have a special concept in place for handling the assets. This is how it works um, from the basic workflow. So whenever an uh, editor in the back end adds a CMS block, uh, edits a CMS block or uh, a product and uploads an image, the original image is uploaded to this S3 bucket. And then um, if yeah, the front end is requested to, uh, to render this product page, for example, uh, the front end checks on the S3 bucket, do I have the original image there? Is it already resized? If not, I resize it according to the definition in the template. Uh, and also store the resized images in, in this uh, common asset storage. And when the same page is requested to render again, the, it, could be, it could be that this request hits another front end, and this checks, do I have the image already resized? Then I reuse this um, so that all the front ends for all the pages only have a few hits to this S3 bucket, and that's it, and then uh, they know the image is resized. And the images is itself, as I mentioned, are delivered through the cloud fund distribution. Okay, um, a bit more of uh, facts. So I said that caching is important. I will go through it a bit quickly because we are um, short on time. So the main goal of uh, caching, uh, caching is we want to achieve a high hit rate. That means we want to cache the things that are requested more, more frequently. So this is the top one goal. Um, caching is always easy. That's what, what I said, but uh, caching things right or caching right is really difficult. Um, so one thing to consider is don't fruit your cache. It's easy to cache things, maybe based on different parameter combinations or things like this, but that's not the goal um, because then you fruit the cache. It's so easy to fruit caches. Choose your cache backend wisely. So there are a couple of different cache backends. You can use um, database, file system, local memory, uh, and central memory uh, like memcache. So and each has drawbacks and pros and cons so you need to uh, check what to use. Um, important for, for high traffic pages is that you need to be aware of never lose all caches at once, so never click clear all cache or uh, have an, an like observer that does something like this. That's really dangerous, that can bring down your system if suddenly all caches are done. Um, cleaning up cache entries is the trick when you cache, so you need to find out um, how to clean up all cache entries that are not required anymore. And especially for things like uh, a shop, you want to be able to purge. Uh, better than purging is refreshing the cache because then the cache is never uh, empty um, on demand. That means if the inventory level for one product um, changes, for example, you want to make sure that all the caches that somehow are related to this product are refreshed. OK, some general magenta performance pointers that we come up with that can be useful for any project is um, we have something in place that um, the, the clearing the cache is not done suddenly. Uh, we queue it up and it's processed by schedule. That makes sure that not suddenly all cache is gone and that when you need to delete the cache, it's only done once. Second thing is uh, the cache cleaning. Um, so Magento per default has some places where caches are like just grow and grow and nobody um, um, cleans it up. So we have something in place there. A general advice is to disable Magento logs. It costs you performance. You don't want to lock all the stuff that uh, it locks per default in production. You can do this with configuration for some logs, but for some you need a known package. Um, actually, if you want something like Varnish or reverse proxy, you need the best thing is to need uh, to tell Magento to send the correct cache headers. That's what we did here. Um, when you have JavaScript and CSS as cache. You want to make sure that with the new deployment, all the um, visitors have the new JavaScript and CSS. So a good way is to prefix it with the timestamp to have a new name. And the general advice, I cannot say, yeah, are, that's really important, this profile. I mean, every application is different, so you need really to dig in where the most time is spent. And there are a couple of nice uh, profile tools around. New Relic is really cool. I would recommend to have a look there. But I won't go into all the details here. 
All these modules, by the way, are available on GitHub, so you can just get them there. Yeah, true. Okay. So the last boring slide. Um, some adjustments that we did, especially for uh, this cloud deployment, is we uh, already compressed JavaScript and CSS on deploy time. We don't do it um, um, on the Magento side. We use uh, the deployment name, or actually the uh, name of the current release, um, as a cache prefix, uh, because it might be that several deployments are live at the same time and that caches don't um, interact or conflict with each other. We have a special cache warm-up script, so whenever we do a new deployment, we make sure that uh, the important stuff is in the cache. Of course, we need some kind of health check that tells the load balance, okay, the front-end server is still healthy and you can use me for load balancing. Um, we have something that purchases the varnish because it's a separate instance. Mag Magento needs to tell them whenever inventory level changes or something like this, that this page should be purged and varnish. We have the special email service in place. That's a thing that you need to consider when you uh, host in the cloud, how to send emails. And you need to find out a smart way of handling assets in this cluster setup. This is, by the way, a short uh, screenshot of all the scheduler tasks that are running on the worker service. You see that there are a couple of services doing the cache cleanup, um, doing, talking with the license servers and things like this. Oh, no, yes. You won. You won. Yeah, so a, a few things that, that we learned in the, in the process of doing this, um, and, and one of the most important ones is actually 404s four are way too expensive. So that's something that uh, you really need to keep an eye on, um, especially when you're relaunching an existing store where there, there might have been a lot of URLs that will lead to uh, 404s. Make sure that you either redirect them or make sure that you have caching in place. Um, I, I will show you a graph in a second uh, where you can see what happens <coughs> if the 404s are not cached, what happens to the performance. Um, another downturn is um, on the cloud front side <coughs> is that the S3 backend cannot ha handle gzip. So when you're doing continuous integration into the cloud, you need to consider that when deploying and bundling that you can't compress the stuff with gzip. And another thing very important to learn, don't ever hit reports in the Magento backend while you're on the production server. Um, this is something that's very important because it, it is a very, very database uh, load heavy um, report functionality. Do that on a separate instance or do it through an, a third party report server. If you have a lot of orders in the system, if you have a lot of traffic, don't use that function because it can actually kill the servers. I need to make sure that the reports don't hit the production database. You can use a read slate for this, something like this. Of course, whenever you do a deployment like that, you cannot foresee everything. You ha you ha and the most important thing is that you're prepared to fix things quickly. And this is where the whole continuous deployment and integration comes in that, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Be ready to deploy really quickly new fi features, new quick fixes um, in, in order to be able to do that. And um, so this, this graph that you see on the right is actually what happens when we deactivated the 404 uh, error handling. So the, the peaks are just amazingly huge. Actually, one, one thing uh, to add to that also is when you are launching for the first time in the cloud, make sure that your server array is scaled up to a lot more than you think you will need because it's much easier for the scaling infrastructure to scale it down if it doesn't need it anymore than to scale it up by three times within a few seconds. That's not possible with an, an auto-scaling infrastructure. So what's continuous deployment and continuous integration? The, the philosophy behind it, of course, is that you should never be scared of releasing to production. Um, we call this a non-event. Releasing to production should be a non-event. You want to have everything figured out before the moment that you release to production. And um, there are a few things that you should keep in mind to achieve that. The, the definition primarily of continuous deployment is that we want on-demand deployment of tested features and fixes in a quick and reliable way. This is, this is really the essence of, of continuous deployment. And how do you achieve that? Primarily, you achieve that by automating everything. You automate the build process, you automate the testing process, and you automate the deployment process. You don't want any manual steps involved in, in getting a, a new release live. And of course, 
part of that is also to do it frequently. So, um, you know, it, it differs very much from client to client how much is necessary. Um, some clients we, we deploy every day, some clients we deploy several times a day, other clients we only deploy every few days. But you'd want to be able to deploy within minutes and at a very high frequency. Okay, what is necessary to, to achieve this? Um, a nice pattern to this is um, think of deployment as a deployment pipeline. Um, I'll go through it with the example of the Angry Birds deployment pipeline. So deployment pipeline actually consists of several stages. In each stage, something is tested. Um, every deployment pipeline begins with the commit and build step. This is the step where you read all the information from your version control, get all the latest source code, um, get the assets from a backup storage, and actually really build an installation package. This is what the package should, uh, should reflect there. Um, this installation package could be grabbed by any developer to set up a new, uh, set up the current release of the Angry Build shop, um, and this same package is used to deploy on all the systems. So one of the next steps is you want to be sure that all the unit tests are still running with the latest changes, and then if it past this stage, you know, okay, this installation package is fine. Then we go and grab this package, install it on a separate latest instance. Um, you know, okay, this package could be installed automatically. We do uh, automated front-end tests based on Selenium to check if you can still add things to the basket, can do orders. And then, important here, of course, we do performance tests to see if the latest changes improved or um, worse the performance. Um, this whole stages is uh, referred to as build downstream and it kind of uh, reflects your test strategy for this project. You test that things could be installed, you test that uh, performance is still good. And in the other direction, it gives instant feedback to the developers. So whenever you do a change, the pipeline gives you feedback if it fails at uh, a certain stage, what might be broken. Have a short look at what the content of this installation package is. So we have the file system in this package. File system has the Magento sources independently from all the custom packages. This is how we, um, we, we separate it for every project uh, using a cool concept with uh, this Modman script. Uh, there's another talk from Colin, I think, um, later this day. So that's a thing I would suggest to um, use this and do it like this. Uh, the package also has the database content has the install binaries um, that has all the logic to set up um, this project based on this installation package. So this is where uh, all the stuff gets installed. Important for the install uh, step is that you adjust all the environment specific settings. This is where the settings PHP file comes into play. Here are all the environment specific settings. Like every environment has different database settings, different domains and so forth. So this needs to be um, adjusted. Okay. Need to move a bit quickly. Um, the end of the deployment pipeline is actually how we get things into the cloud. So we have one step um, that copies over this package to this S3 bucket, and from there it's uh, used to deploy staging. So one step is we um, have exactly the same environment on uh, a stage domain. Um, we deploy it on staging. Um, there, the so called integration tests are done because the staging environment is connected to either the live or staging versions of all the external interfaces. And after it's passed the test there, we actually click a button and this same release is deployed to production. Have a look um, how the deployment to production looks like. So you might have uh, still the architecture overview in mind. So let's say a current release is live. Um, so what we do when we want to deploy a new version is we actually clone the deployment. Cloning deployment is a concept of write scale. And basically it gives you like the frame and the definition of which uh, server areas do you have? How are the servers booted up there? So this is what uh, the cloning gives you. We adjust one uh, input for this deployment. It's the version number that we want to deploy. So uh, we want to deploy version 89 in this case. And then we click a button to start it all. Um, as first, a worker instance boots up and it has several scripts that um, yeah, prepares the deployment. So for example, we need a separate ELB for this new deployment and then we enable the whole deployment, all the errors pop up, and then we have the new version deployed in the new server infrastructure. We could actually modify our host file to point to the ELB IP and see the new release. Um, both deployments share the same database. Um, this has the advantage that when you switch over then the DNS with the root 53 service, no sessions is lost. So you can just switch over and the customer 
don't really recognize that sounds that, that a new deployment happened. Yeah, how does this look like in real life? This is, is just a little account of, of how the first four days uh, of the new Angry Birds store looked like. So basically, we, we launched the site on the first day um, and st started having the regular you know, traffic patterns that they used to have on the old site as well. And then on the second day, we already launched the new space theme um, because it was that close to the launch of, of space already. And uh, once we had launched that, you can see on the traffic here, you know, we have the, we have the general traffic pattern and then from the new release that we deployed. And then the next step was actually the launch of the space game and you can see how the area scales up. And then you can see what happened when the US wakes up. And uh, you know, that, that just gives you an idea of, of how um, this actually happens then in, in real life. And on the fourth day, we did the next deployment um, to already include some performance improvements of what we've learned. And what's, what's really interesting in this whole infrastructure is that uh, in some instances we had to use 25 different servers, but the amount of front-end servers that actually need to run Magento uh, is only one to two. There's in fact only 40% uh, average CPU usage on, on those two front-end servers that we have. So in total, pretty much one front-end server would have even been enough to handle uh, the checkout processes. Um, everything else is, is handled with the entire uh, caching infrastructure. That's it, we are at the end of the time. <laughs> so thanks for listening and we have time for um, questions now.